out this month. Welcome to the Manuscript Academy podcast, brought to you by a writer and an agent who both believe that education is key. The beauty is the people you meet along the way, and that community makes all the difference. Here at the Manuscript Academy, you can learn the skills, make the connections, and have access to experts all from home. I'm Julie Kingsley. And I'm Jessica Sinsheimer. Put down your pens, pause your word counts, and enjoy. Hello, friends. We are so happy to welcome author Sarah Reed. Yes, I know. It's the perfect name for an author, and we will talk about that. She is the author of The Amazing Principles of Emotion, the E is in parentheses, and it just came out this month. We're so happy to welcome Sarah to the podcast today. Just a brief note that if you are, for example, driving carpool, uh, we do briefly use some adult language, mostly because we both love an editor so much we uh, used some intense words there. So if you would like to avoid that, skip to minute five. Otherwise, enjoy the episode. Sarah, tell us how you found your agent and how your writing process started. Okay, so I was the usual, like, r- dictated stories to my mom, wrote in elementary school, wrote in high school, creative writing classes in college. But I sort of didn't get the memo in college that, like, it could be a job, that you could be, like, a writer or an editor or an agent or a, any, I, like, didn't even know publishing was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> that you could work in. I was in California and nobody told me. Same. And so I didn't then, know either. It's a California problem. Right. Like I think if I'd gone to, to school in New York or something, I might be an editor right now. And then I took a big old dog leg into music and that like really survived, satisfied the creative itch for a while. And then I came back to it in my early 40s and kind of consumed all of of the writing know-how that I possibly could from every source that I could find. I queried these two, my two books have sort of leapfrogged one another. Like I wrote the first one, shelved it, wrote the second one, shelved it, wrote the first one again. It's like a long story. So this was, so I, I got my agent, Laura Bradford, who is so great. She's just a total force of nature. On the third book that I queried, and it was a total rewrite of the first book that I queried. So like I said, I put that one on the shelf, wrote another one, queried that one, got nowhere with that one, rewrote the first one, queried it as my third one and like end to end rewrite. Like this was not even the same book. And that's when Laura, that's when I signed with Laura. And that's when she saw, she sold Johanna Porter is not sorry to Kat Klein at Graydon House, who is also I just love like, Kat. <laughs> love Kat, Kat is amazing. Can you describe Cat? I know how I describe Cat. I want to see if it's the same. So, so we were just talking co- a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about Hayao Miyazaki, and she referred to Hayao Miyazaki as a warm blanket of what the fuckery, <laughs> and <laughs> that just summed up Cat. Like think that that's she would perfect. think of it. I don't that's know how perfect. to describe her. She's just such a warm. She's so like warm and human. And yet she's such a pro, you know? She's both warm and kind, and yet somehow at the same time, a total badass. And like, yes. those are two things that yes. don't usually go together in that cool yeah. way. And she's a great editor. I mean, she just, the things that, the the ways that she worked on my books were just like, I was like, I could not have done that. You know, I didn't see that and you saw it and... We made it like the whole thing just kind of went, you know? Gosh, I love this story so much. One, I love how the the tenacity that you had just to kind of keep at it and keep like trying something new and going back and keeping that original energy until you have your second book out. It came out January 9th. And I would say, Sarah, that Sarah Reed, I forgot to say this, is the coolest author name ever. Yeah, it is. (laughs) I love it so much. I just, I almost can't even like, it is a character name within this whole thing. Principles of Emotion came out January 9th. Congratulations. Thank you. So, so like summarize this book for our listeners without giving away too much. Okay. So this book is about genius level mathematician who solves this like 200 year old proof that is considered impossible to solve. And has the potential to change the world. But she's so damaged by her prodigy childhood and by like a lifetime of conditional love, of getting love and approval for 
what she does and how she performs and being spectacular. And, you know, that and genetics or whatever all kind of come together in her to create this really gnarly anxiety and panic disorder. And so she's very secluded and she is struggling to, to put this thing out into the world and put her name on it. And that's like the one thing that she wants is she just wants credit. She wants her name on this thing. And she's also fighting the, so she's fighting herself and she's fighting the prejudices of her field. And she is also contending with her father, who was the orchestrator of her prodigy childhood and who was rather jealous of her accomplishments. And so she goes and she tries to present this proof at a conference because she's like, I put myself in front of people. There is no way that they can say this belongs to anybody else. But she can't do it. She break, She has a panic attack at the podium. The whole thing collapses. And then she gets some help from a very unlikely source, which dun, is dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Here she comes. The, the one love of her life was Isaac Wells, who was a high school dropout, house carpenter, who everybody for his whole life has told him, like, you're going to wind up in jail, you know, you're not going to amount to anything, you know? So they've both sort of been seen for who everybody else thinks they are. That's such a perfect place to like end off so that people are still like, I need to find out what happens. Okay, I can't help but ask, how did you feel when writing this? Because I personally felt so much tension and so much, don't let it happen, don't let it happen, don't let it happen, don't let it happen. <laughs> like the whole time I was incredibly worried about, how do I put this without spoiling it? I was worried that the one copy of her work, something terrible was going to happen to it. And it just seemed like such a vulnerable position. I just couldn't, I couldn't imagine that something terrible would not happen. You know, is that Chekhov's gun, right. like Chekhov's proof? Like if you have the proof in the first act, it's going to like something terrible is going to happen to it in the third act. I don't right. know. So like, I was just like edge of my seat about like, don't happen, don't happen, don't happen. Did you yeah. feel like that when you were writing it? Did you literally sit on the edge of your seat, like tap, 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 tap on your keyboard? <laughs> like, that's a good question. Well, sort of and sort of not. Well, I knew what was going to happen in the end. So this was an end to end rewrite of another book. And when I was about, I don't know, when I was about a third of the way through, I was like, ah, I know it's going to happen at the end. So in a way that just makes it fun. Like instead of feeling all the tension, I'm feeling this kind of like, like I'm a, you know, super villain putting together my little puzzle, you know? Yeah, I, I saw yeah. that. I saw you doing that. I was, <laughs> it was funny. I had, I had that feeling like, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. I, I totally. Oh, you I, had I, faith that it was going to work out? Yes. Oh, I did not. I was like, her whole life is going to be ruined by oh these men around her. Jessica. Ah. <laughs> okay. Can you read to us the first page or the first page and a half? Okay. On the day that felt like the end, I arrived at my grandmother's house, having survived a transcontinental nonstop flight on nothing more than benzodiazepines and the kindness of a flight attendant named Parthi. I was all of 23 years old. My cab pulled up behind a motorcycle parked on the street, and I got out and climbed the steps to the yard. Nestled at the bottom of a hill near a bend of Rock Creek in swampy D.C., the grand wooden structure had a reserved manor, set back amid four giant oaks and an acre of overgrown garden. A porch wrapped around three sides, and at the corner rose a matronly tower. My grandmother lived there alone. It's no wonder a person would want company in a place that big. As I reached the porch, a man wearing a tool belt came to the front door, and my heart rate spiked. I wasn't expecting anyone but Lila, but it only took a second to see that he was just as startled as I, which was oddly calming. He was younger than me, but not by a lot, taut and wiry, with close-cut brown hair and a long, bony nose. He held the door open for me, and I stepped inside. Lila's voice carried from the back of the house. Maggie, finally! Isaac, could you help her with her bags before you go? I had that feeling when you have to talk to someone and you're not ready, that sudden exposure. And I think he felt it too. He looked up, his expression flat and opaque. His eyes were an unusual color, reddish brown, like cinnamon. I must have looked too close. And for a split second, his defense slipped. Suddenly, we really saw each other. And it surprised us both. I love that because like, okay, you don't say it. But just the level of attunement these two characters have for each other, we can tell that is a collision course in a good way. And I think it's so fascinating how you put so much on this page that we'll come back later. Was yeah. that a conscious choice or did it just work out? 
It's sort of a conscious choice. I mean, you know, you rewrite the beginning of a book. Oh, it's that is probably like the first five pages of a book are probably the most written <laughs> pages of the entire book, you know, because you want to come back and you want to make sure they're I'm really big on the idea of the contract with the reader or the promise that you make to a reader about a book. And as a reader, especially, you know, that if I read the first few pages of a book, I, I don't need everything. I don't need like, I just need to know what kind of story I'm getting myself into. Like, mm -hmm. what is the vibe? Like, and so it was really important to me. It's really important to me as a writer to get that on my first few pages. Like, what's the vibe of this book? What are we getting into? Like, here's a person with anxiety. Here's, you know, an isolated person with a lot of issues. But here's a big, awesome house. And here's a cute carpenter. And, yeah. you know. I think yeah. that the setting, especially in D.C. and a place in D.C. that we don't consider D.C., even though I know it's there, was fascinating. And I love how the house turned into, as setting turned into character throughout the book. Mm -hmm. I thought that was terrific. I mean, I think that I like that she's older. I think that yeah. is. Like, I get like, a I was, lot of I was like, like, yeah, that. that's right. You know? Yeah. yeah. And so and I think just like that moment, you really slowed down his eyes. And yeah. the cinnamon eyes, I don't think I've heard that. I thought that was true. Yeah, I haven't either. I thought that was cool. I was like, why didn't I think of that? I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. this book, and I wanted to mention this book is an Amazon editor's pick yeah. as well, which is very cool. I know. I was very excited. As a romance. Yeah. Which yeah. is so interesting because I did not set out to write a romance. Really? What did you no. think it was? Literary fiction? Woman's fiction? I thought it was... Women, I sort of have a beef with the term women's fiction, but yeah, I mean, that's basically, I thought it was like women's fiction, contemporary mm -hmm. fiction, mm -hmm. literary fiction in the way that they call like Kristen Hanna literary fiction. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I really did not think it was a romance. I didn't, I was not like, I'm writing a romance oh, It had all. all the romance feels to me. I don't know. Well, yeah. that's so interesting because it's like intellectual romance, right? Like I found a quote yeah. I really like, there's a feeling when you meet someone that somehow you've known them all your life and not even all your life. Like you've known them all of some other life where you are completely yourself, not the one you're living where you are who people expect you to be, but some better life, the one you should have been living all along. That's how it was with Isaac. Oh, I, know. I love that. And it's, I love it's, that. It's that's one of those things where like, I wrote that. Like, that's so yeah. cool. It's so beautiful. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting because it's like, you're appealing to us intellectually, romantically, not just emotionally, romantically. And mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. You're letting us think about it in a way, like your character approaches love differently than most characters mm -hmm. do because her perspective on so many things is so different. And I think that's really yeah. lovely to see. Well, that yeah. goes into this next question that I had. So Meg is such an interesting character whose intellect is her greatest gift, but it's also kind of her albatross. And so how did you come up with her as a character? And do you have any tips for writers out there um, in character development? Because I think you do a great job with it. That's a great question. This character has kind of been living with me for a really long time. And she was very loosely inspired by Margaret Hale, the protagonist of uh, Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South which is a Victorian era. It's a romance, but Elizabeth Gaskell does this amazing social commentary about you know labor versus capital and industrialization versus agriculture and all wrapped around this like incredible love story. So this character, how did I come up with her? So that's kind of where she came from. That's just where the feeling of this character came from. And it was funny, I had a, I was doing a release event last night and I was being interviewed by Marnie Penning, who narrates the audio version, which is unbelievable. She is so good. So if anybody's into audiobooks, the narration for this is so great. And she was like, why math? And I just got thinking, you know, once a character lands where, I, where they should have been all along, it almost feels inevitable. Like, well, well, of course, it was always going to be math. But I actually tried her out as a, a historian. Oh, wow, really? And some other kind of scientist. And for a while, she had supernatural powers. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love that. My process is so weird. I do not recommend. <laughs> so I wrote some short stories about parts of this book, like as complete short stories. I just really spent a lot of time and a lot of words with this character. And then when I when I kind of settled on math and when I settled on that she was a researcher and that she was a scientist, you know, I really got fascinated by how the 
scientific mind at that level kind of wraps around and meets the creative mind, you know, that you have to, yeah. like the, with the epigraph, you know, that, that living in ambiguity and, and uncertainty and self-doubt and, you know, all these things that we feel as doing creative work where you're like, oh my God, I have such imposter syndrome. This is terrible. And then you have this great elation that I've created this thing. You know, we don't necessarily think of science as being like that, but it is. So that was really fascinating to me about her. Mm. But um, she's also a brave, she's a feminist, she mm -hmm. takes no crap, she, you know, I mean, eventually. <laughs> is that, is right. that a spoiler? Take that out. Take that out. No, because she's like, and this was important to me too, that she's burdened by anxiety and panic. And she has to really regulate her life a lot. She can't do a lot of things that a lot of other people can do. But she is does not doubt her abilities. Like, she does not doubt her intellect. And she doesn't have any trouble knowing that she's smarter than, like, all the, you know, boys in her class. That, right, but you know, she's also like a good friend or a good cousin. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, she's very thoughtful. You know, and I think you did a great job. And I talk on here all the time, my teaching days. But, like, when you're really smart, your brain gets really complicated in some ways. You know, it's almost like more passages are opened up. And I felt mm -hmm. all the nuance of that. And so that's just interesting that it took you so long to, to get to her. But it sounds like once you found her and math and this is the way it was going to be, it just opened up. Of course, this was going to be the way she was going to be. And once you were there, did you fall into a place where you were just like, Meg would do this or she wouldn't do that? You know, it must have been very clear at a point. Well, of yeah. course, she's not going to do that because she would do it this way. Yeah, I did. And that's one of the really fun things about writing a character who has a very clear, what am I trying to say? Like a calling, like a thing that they do. My first book was about an artist. This one's about a mathematician. And both of those things were, were like central to their lives and their selves, themselves. And it does give you like a lens through which she sees everything. You know, like she can apply the sort of logic of math to everything, you know, and she yeah. applies it in the first few chapters you know, with the postulates of this relationship. I thought it was so interesting that even though she could make so much money off of this math that she solved, she was very concerned about how important it was for saving the planet too. Yeah. And I, I thought that it was a really nice, refreshing way to see a character who saw the world that way. Mm -hmm. And it's a formula for resistance, right? So it's like resistance friction using less energy to make things right. work so that we can do all of that. It almost made me wonder, is that a metaphor for her life though? Because she's got all this forward momentum and yet there's so much resistance from the world just because she's female. Right. And right. she's beautiful. And she's and anxious. Pretty. One of my favorite scenes was when she was putting on the mask of the makeup and trying to figure out the outfit to go present mm -hmm. the proof. And that was just like how women have to armor up to go out in the world so that you're not too pretty, but you're, you know, you're put together, but you're not this. And it's just tight right. enough and really interesting. So let's talk about Isaac. Okay. So we go off where, because we've had this one character. How did Isaac come through just as he was, or did you play around with him as well? Okay. So the first time I wrote this book, I wrote it from his point of view. No. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was a totally different book. But it was funny because it was always Meg's story. But I wrote it the first time from his point of view about her story and his story, too. So I knew him pretty well. Where did he come from? I mean, he's sort of loosely inspired by the male lead in Elizabeth Gaskell's book. Although the male lead in that book is very successful, but is an industrialist, you know, and that's how, you know, and they're very different people. So I was curious how if you were if this was and God willing made into a movie, how would you cast <laughs> Wouldn't that Emma, be so fun? Uh, Meg and Isaac? Oh, my God. Isaac, well, James McAvoy might be too old for mm -hmm. Isaac, but James McAvoy a few years ago, oh, my mm -hmm. God, totally Isaac. I have pictures mm -hmm. of him on my Pinterest board where he's like in jeans, leather jacket. I thought you had a jacket. Pinterest board. I just felt it. I was like, yes, I was. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. And they've got, and his hair is kind of like a little messed up and he's got some stubble and he's got those blue eyes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, Isaac doesn't have blue eyes, but it's just like, and he's got this groove in his forehead. Um, and Meg, there's actually a model. Ashley Graham would be Meg if Ashley Graham were an actor. And James McAvoy would be Isaac. I'm seeing it. 
I see it in my head. Was it scary to make all of these editorial changes partway through? So can you give us a timeline? So it, you started with Isaac's point of view and then, mm-hmm. you know, and then after that it switched to Mix, and then it switched to her having different careers. And was that frightening to you to make these changes or was it exhilarating? <gasps> did, you, did you do those before you got the agent, right? Was it before? I, so I had finished the entire book from Isaac's point of view before I signed with Laura. So that was already on the shelf. And I think I knew that I was going to rewrite it from Meg's point of view. And that was going to be book two in my contract. I wouldn't call it scary. Although I I have to say, like, now book three is trying to kill me. And (laughs) partly it's because it's such an inefficient process that I've gone through with these two books. You know, to, like, write the entire thing and then write the entire thing again and then maybe write the entire thing again. So I'm actually a little scared now that... Who knows how long it's going to take me to write another book, you know? Well, I think it's so lovely that you're open to that, though, because if you had been like, nope, this is how it is, take it or leave it, we wouldn't have this beautiful book in front of us now. Right. It's, I definitely have this feeling that I'm just not done with it until it's right, you know? Like my first book, Johanna Porter is Not Sorry, like I had firmly shelved that book. I was like, not working, fine. I'm going to go write something else. And then I came back to it and I was like, oh, don't keep don't keep writing the same book for 10 years. You know, like, don't keep working. But I was like, it's not right yet. I haven't done justice. And the same thing happened with Principles of Emotion with Meg, where I was like, I have not done justice to this character yet. Like, I have not told her story yet. And I just am a very stubborn slightly driven person so you know I keep just working on it until it gets there what Mm -hmm. tips do you have for writers who are feeling like there's something more they can pull out of their characters how do they get there that's a good question I wish I understood that better myself I think you can really get into there there's a few things you can really get into the way they think, like what, like I was saying earlier, if they do a thing and they're into a thing, like how does a person who does that thing think about the world? And what are their like patterns of thought? And how do those patterns of thought like apply to other things in their lives? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're an athlete, you're going to have, you're going to look at the world in a certain way. You're going to be very embodied. You're going to think about things through your body. I was trying to write a novel about a marathon runner and like, she was very much it, it she was interacting with the world through her body in a way that these characters don't, you know? Well, I disagree um, because I think on the spicy scenes that May is unexpectedly in her body. And oh yeah, not, yeah. So I mean, yeah. I think that was an interesting part of her character mm-hmm. where she was so in her brain and then he brought something out of her that yeah. she didn't remember that she had. I thought that was really interesting. And the, and I think what you're talking about is giving us scenes where we can uh, we can be with the character in different ways so the character gets fuller and more dynamic mm-hmm. via the scenes we're putting from space to space, of course, with the stakes within them. I don't know if mm-hmm. that makes sense. I think it makes sense. It does. And also just getting very, I like to get very interior with my characters. Like I love what they call free and direct speech, you know, where you're you may be in first person or third person, but you're like communicating the character's internal thoughts as if they're speaking to you, as if they're just speaking. It's not in quotes or anything like that mm-hmm. or italics or anything. It's just like separate line. And so I've really worked on different ways of getting across interiority and what's really happening on the inside of this person. Mm-hmm. And that requires developing some technique. You know, I've really mm-hmm. had to like look at it. I have about 50 craft books over on my shelf over there. Can you recommend any of those craft books for that lesson in particular? Yes. I love, uh, where is it? The Art of Perspective by Christopher Castellani. Nobody has probably ever heard of it, but it's talking about like point of view and the finer points of that. My favorite craft book of all time is called The Modern Library Writers Workshop by Stephen Koch. It's green. It's thin. It's like all the good stuff and none of the fluff, you know? And it's not even a how-to at all. It's just like this wise mentor, like kind of talking you through a writing life. And so much, there's like 
so much gold in that book. Do you want to give away a book? Uh, sure. Okay, Sarah, could okay. you give us a code word and they will email it to us and we will give them a copy of your book? One winner, a copy. Yes. Okay, a code word. Ah, a code word. Uh, azalea. Azalea. Like the flower. Okay. Yeah, okay. The flower. So the first person to email academy at manuscriptwishlist.com with Azalea in the subject line will receive a copy of this beautiful book. Going back to the idea of characters that bring out something in your main character. Can you talk about Cheryl, her childhood friend? She's only there for maybe a couple pages, but I feel like that just opened up a whole world for me of yeah. interior possibility of where she could have gone as a person. Mm-hmm. I had a friend who, she didn't have a pony, but she made the barrettes with the ribbons on them, and she had a very girly room, and um, you know, and I actually did have a childhood friend named Cheryl, and I just kind of thought about, like, I felt, I think a lot of us probably feel a little bit out of place as children, like, I don't really know how to do this girl thing, and, you know, and so Meg is like a, she's kind of the logical extreme of a lot of the things that I experience as a child, right? Not anything near as intense as she went through. But there's just little pieces of it that get expanded in her character. And Cheryl was one of them. You know, this idea of like this girlhood, this kind of like prosperous, friendly, easygoing girlhood, you know, where you have friends and ribbons and ponies and and that's all fine and it's normal. And oh, I don't know, just how, how when that memory comes back to her, like how beautiful it is, but also how painful it is, like how it throws her life and her experience into such stark relief. It's interesting because I can see how our culture loves to talk about everything girls like as frivolous. Right. And I could see how her father would very easily fall into that and say, what are you doing? Why are you doing these frivolous things when you could be, you know, solving these enormous equations? But I thought it was just such an interesting brief glimpse into the parallel universe she would live in if she was allowed to be a kid. Yeah. And to Mm. be rather than do. Right. Exactly. So interesting. Let's just, can we turn this over to something else right now? Because I stalked you on Instagram (laughs) and you're such a great marketer, natural, like just very good in front of the camera on those reels. (laughs) Thank you. I feel like video is not. (laughs) No, you're great, great, great. Um, but you talked about the overstimulation of all of this, like trying to write, trying to market, you know, going out there, there in the world, doing your book launch and that overstimulation. So it's like, you're in a really interesting place. You have your third book you're trying to do. You've got marketing that you're doing and you have this dichotomy of worlds. So can you give us any tips on this oh, process? It's just really freaking hard. That came up again from last night at this book release event that actually got rescheduled because we had torrential rain on Tuesday. We like it was such a rainstorm we had to cancel and move it to Wednesday. So that was fun. But that kind of came up in our conversation last night and it is just really hard because I feel like the creative space that I need to get into especially in a first draft, especially in the beginning of a project is this very receptive sort of stillness. Like I'm just waiting. I'm like the strength card in tarot. I don't know if you came across my sub stack, <laughs> talked about it in there. Like the strength card in tarot is not about like, I'm like a big strong and I'm going to go club the thing that I want and drag it back. You know, it's, it's more like I am going to like be magnetic and like receive the things that I want, and the lion is going to come lie down in my lap. And that's the space I need to be in right now with this new book. And it does not go well with all of the like, big, bright, square things that I have to do for everything else, you know, like the marketing and the release and the, oh, and all the other stuff. Plus my job, plus I'm a mom, plus I have a husband, you know, i got a body I'm trying to take care of. I mean, like, I got to deal with money. Like, all those things don't go well with this amorphous, receptive space. And so I have to, I just have to find ways. We were talking about how hard it is to find your way into that space on purpose, you know, rather than like, oh, here it is. I feel inspired. The muse has sprinkled her fairy dust on me, you know. It's like, how do we get to that place 
intentionally? How do I sit down at my desk and get into that and turn off all the other stuff? And it's really hard. It's really and hard. I was going to ask if you found anything that's lion bait. I know. I was like, <laughs> I'm like, where's my lion? Come I know. find me. I'm in I Maine. know. Immersion <laughs> is my favorite thing. Like if I can get away, and this is like, I have the privilege to do this every now and then. My kids are older. My husband is supportive. You know, every now and then I can get away for a couple of days and just bring nothing but my laptop and a change of clothes and a couple of books and a notebook. And that's it. And I just am by myself living and breathing, you know, and giving myself all that uninterrupted time. And, you know, like I communicate with a lot of moms who are writers because Jessica and I do Moms Writers Club. And it is so hard when your kids are younger and you've got a lot going on. Like you're just every minute of your day practically is spoken for. But getting like a day and a half is really lion bait. Like if I could get two nights and a day in between, that'll like set me up for months. I bet there are moms too who could work out a schedule of like trading off who's doing childcare so yes, the other one can yes. get away. I think we can work out more than we think we can. Yeah. We just, it's part learning Has anyone figured it. it out in your mom writers group? We're working on it. I mean, I think part of it is asking for it and taking yourself seriously. And creative work is real work. You know, this is rather than trying to fit yourself around everybody else all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, we accept that people who work in construction need tools and we accept that right. people who work in kitchens need food and knives and ovens. Right. I wish we could just accept that writers need time and quiet. Yes. And you'd think that both of those would be easier to find and accept, <laughs> but no, they're not. <laughs> it's so hard to find quiet. The world just feels so loud. Yes, I agree. And the inside of my brain is very loud sometimes. Mm. So even, and that's why the, that's why getting away from my house into like, Getting as far out into the boonies as I can is helpful, too. Like, lots and lots of literal quiet for, like, miles around yeah, me. Right. I mean, there's sometimes otherwise... that we can almost hear each other think if we're too close to too many people. Like, as if there's, like, brain radio and we're picking up on it, even if we don't know. Oh, I have such bad system. brain radio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and can we talk a moment about that gorgeous tower she has with the curved chalkboard? Because oh. what a perfect creative space that could be. Yeah. Isn't that cool? That was just dreamy to me. There's actually a house in Stanton, Virginia, which is just over the Blue Ridge from where I live in Charlottesville, that was so inspiring to me. I found it online and I like called the guy up and he runs it as a bed and breakfast. And I was like, can I just like, I'm writing a book. Can I, will you come just show me around? And of course he was happy to do it because he had renovated this whole place and we like walked around it. And I was like, oh, like a lot of Victorians have these little tiny turrets that are almost just like little sitting rooms. But this is like a real big one that you can really live in. You know, a theme I'm picking up on things that you have said, I think writers should, as their homework, go out and make what they might see as an irrational ask. Ask someone with the setting to draw you around. Ask a mom to trade off childcare. Ask somebody who knows something who can help you out. And I bet right. a lot of people will say yes. So, okay, yes. writer out there, think of something you can ask a nice person and keep asking until you saw somebody says yes. Right, right. Ask for something a little bigger than you think you're going to get. Well, yeah. this is something else I'm noticing about you. So we talked about marketing. We talked about being overwhelmed. But you've – talk about the five – is it the 5 a.m. Writers Club or is it the Moms – like, t tell me – Moms Writers Club. Moms Writers Club. So you have built community. And within that community, you have – you all have a built-in group of marketing warriors. And I, I think <laughs> it's so important to – like, wherever your community is, like, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's – on Twitter, whether it's at the Manuscript Academy or whether it's at your local library or whether it's wherever, it doesn't matter. But those people, they're your soldiers. Like you've done yeah. everything that you need to do, like as a working mom. So I just want to commend you for that. Like Thank you. you did it. Like you're on, you're on Instagram saying it's hard, but you did it. Thank you. Couldn't sometimes have done I it without Jess. Sometimes I think it's the people who find it hard but keep going who end up getting more success than the people who are like, mm -hmm. eh, it's fine. I can do it. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, and I, I think, think just, it's, it's not an isolation, right? Like it's... Right. I think you have to find a way, for me anyway, I have to find a way to do this as myself. Like I have to find a way to do this in a genuine way. And, and by this, I mean having an online presence, being on social media, doing these YouTube videos with Jess, like... 
and even writing. Like I, the only thing that makes this worth doing is if I do it as myself and I get to really be myself and get to be transparent. And I'm Gen X myself and I have a little bit of a like, you know, y'all can take it or leave it vibe. You know, that's who I and am. And solidarity. So that's helpful. That's like a little, a little bonus of being Gen X, I think. But like, I've just had to, you know, it's funny because another friend of mine was like something about like your brand and your built really great like brand building and I was like I guess I didn't really know that I was brand building but that has just sort of been my come from all this time and it's really connected me with some really amazing other people like Jessica and like all the people in Mom's Writers Club I mean I think when you put your vulnerability out there and you put your struggles out there to a certain degree you allow other people to be themselves too you know and I think there were just a lot of moms out there struggling to figure out like how to be writers on top of everything else. Can you tell us a funny story that somebody shared in mom's writers group? There was this, there was one, um, (laughs) there was one mom who would stay up writing by like trying not to wake. I think she was like in her bed, like her husband is sleeping and she's got the baby cam light. And that's what she's writing by, like the light (laughs) of the baby cam. And she's like trying to write books by the light of the baby cam. And like there, but there are just so many moms who are like whipping out their notebook in the pickup line at school when they've got five minutes. I mean. Yeah. At the hockey games, you know. Oh, yeah. For lacrosse practice. Yes. I wrote plenty at soccer practices and soccer tournaments. And yeah. Weirdest place you've written? Weirdest place I've written? Uh, I don't know. Is that an appropriate place? Is that an appropriate question? (laughs) Uh, I was just thinking about like one of my um I my been former boss weird was, places. Oh, that's funny. My my former boss used to like say like, "Oh yeah, I did this deal while I was on an elephant." You know, like I did oh. this one while I was at the dentist. Yeah. No, I don't know. I don't really have any weird places. Oh my gosh. What's your number one advice for writers? Put your butt in the chair and do the work. I've got a chair tattooed on my arm. You do not. It's beautiful. It's It's a chair with flowers. And then like the flowers are all coming up out of the chair. That is the coolest thing I've ever seen. (laughs) And it's like, you got to put your butt in the chair. Like I can, I get so in my head and I can lie around and I, and you know, we do a lot of writing and thinking in the shower and as we're falling asleep and all that stuff. But at some point you got to put your butt in the chair and you've got to do the work. I think you're my hero. Like, that's the coolest thing. People are like, what would you put? I'm like, I don't know. And I was like, I, that is perfect. That is perfect. <laughs> Thank you. It's a beautiful chair. Awesome. Where can we find you online? Uh, my website is Sarah Reed, S-A-R-E-A-D dot net. But I am probably most active on Instagram right now. Can I ask one nerdy question that you might hate and we'll delete it? Yes. Okay. Sure. So you talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and how we mm-hmm. can't know everything all at once. Right. How do writers deal with that level of uncertainty, Heisenberg or otherwise? Oh, the Heisenberg principle for writing is like drafting for me. Like, I can't know the whole story while I'm writing sentences. And I can't know the sentences while I'm thinking about the whole story. And I need both somehow or other. And I don't know. You just got to like keep like flipping your lens back and forth. Like forest trees, forest trees, you know? (laughs) Are there any other math metaphors you can think of for writing? Mm, The chambered nautilus came up when I wrote this from Isaac's point of view. And that's the, that's the, the golden spiral mollusk that lives in the sea. And, you know, you slice them in half and they're this really cool, like they have these chambers and the spiral formation, you know, you've probably seen pictures of those. And that It's like the way the animal grows is from the small chamber to the bigger chambers, to the bigger chambers, to the bigger chambers. Like, and I just love that, like, iteration and reiteration and reiteration and reiteration. You get a little bigger and a little more beautiful every time. And then the whole process is the golden ratio is that beautiful spiral, you know? And so how's that for a groovy math metaphor? I love it. It's beautiful. (laughs) What genre did you pitch this? What genre did you use when you pitched this? Well, this was book two of a two book contract. So it was women's fiction, contemporary. I'm curious about that. People always get so worried about all the different, you know, sub genres within women's fiction. So yeah, Yeah. I mean, and it's certainly got a, you know, prominent romantic storyline. So I'm sort of not surprised it's getting embraced as romance. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm so happy we got to do this. It has really been a pleasure. Likewise. We are so glad that you joined us. 
And as always, we appreciate your feedback. Just head on over to the iTunes store and let us know what you think. It not only helps us make this podcast be the best it can be, but it also affects our ratings within the iTunes platform. We'd love to hear from you. If you're feeling brave and want to submit your page for our first pages podcast, you can send it to academy at manuscriptwishlist.com with first pages podcast in the subject line. We'd also just love to hear from you. And if you'd like to learn more about the Manuscript Academy and everything we have to offer, just jump on over to manuscriptacademy.com.